On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA upgrades their facilities to prepare for the first crewed Artemis mission, the United Launch Alliance goes up for sale, and Rocket Lab ditches the helicopters in favor of waterproofing. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get into it. This is the Space Race. It has only been three months since Artemis 1's Orion capsule splashed down in the Pacific Ocean after orbiting the moon, and in that time, NASA has been working on a checklist of refinements, repairs, and upgrades that they need to make before they send astronauts on that same path on Artemis 2. On February 27th, Jim Free, NASA's Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, tweeted out this report, which details the changes coming to the Artemis mission's launch systems. Several of the items on the list are just repairs from the Artemis 1 launch. NASA's space launch system is currently the most powerful rocket ever flown, and made quite the mess of the mobile launcher vehicle. 8.8 million pounds of force blew the doors clear off the mobile launcher's elevators and damaged the crew access arm. That's actually some pretty light damage considering the power of the SLS, but regardless, NASA has to spend time repairing those things and adapting the mobile launcher for the most important items on the list, the emergency egress life safety system. The original emergency egress system was used during the shuttle days, and allowed suited up astronauts to escape the launch structure in cases of dangerous failure. Basically, a series of baskets were set up on zip lines at the 195 foot high level of the launch tower. Astronauts in danger would leave the shuttle, toddle across the crew access arm as fast as they could, get in, and descend rapidly to a landing area over 1200 feet away. Here's a video of the last time these three-person baskets were released about 10 years ago. That kind of looks like a lot of fun, honestly, but given their intended use, I'm not sure the people who may have been forced to use them would think so. This system just wasn't needed for the uncrewed Artemis 1, so it wasn't installed until now. But rest assured that an updated version of these baskets will be ready for the crew of Artemis 2, just in case. With the crew element also comes changes to the countdown clock and liftoff schedule to include time for the astronauts to get their suits on and otherwise prepare, as well as making the trip to the rocket and getting into their Orion capsule. The Orion processing facility apparently also got some upgrades. NASA reports that preparation for the capsule is almost complete. Artemis 2's Orion had to be upgraded with extras like communication components, extra displays, controllers, upgraded hatches, environmental control, life support, waste management, and fire suppression. Not to mention the addition of exercise equipment so the crew can stay healthy for their 10 day long trip, and some extra testing to make sure that the thermal systems that keep them comfortable are still working as intended. There's a lot more that goes into these vehicles when people need to ride in them. The Artemis II Orion even has to get acoustics testing done this spring to make sure the sound of liftoff doesn't harm the crew. Aside from that, the administration reported that the launch abort system, which would jettison the Orion in the case of a mid-launch failure, is also just about done. This is the group of solid fuel boosters that sit in the pointed nose cone at the very top of the rocket. NASA also made some upgrades to their facilities, like the altitude testing chambers, which simulate deep space environments in order to test the seals on the Orion. They also made modifications to the vehicle assembly building where the rocket is put together so that the SLS can be pre-pressurized during stacking. Artemis 1 apparently had to make do with portable units that did the same thing. They're even building a new 1.4 million gallon hydrogen tank at Launch Complex 39B, which will help decrease the time between launch attempts should the SLS be fussy this time around. It's clear NASA is taking no chances with Artemis 2, nor should they, it's easy to forget how dangerous crew missions are when we so routinely send people up to the ISS and recover them without much trouble, but we haven't been to the moon in over 50 years, and NASA hasn't forgotten that. They've even taken every bit of data they gathered from the SLS tests, the Orion recovery tests in 2018, and Artemis 1, and have implemented a series of changes to both procedure and hardware. Artemis 2 is slated to launch in May 2024 and will involve a simple flyby of the moon. 
The four-person crew will be spending 10 days in space, making just a quick flyby of the moon while testing the human side of the equipment on board their Orion capsule. It will be quick, uncomplicated, and if NASA's work pays off, completely safe. Fingers crossed. It looks like the United Launch Alliance, one of the most important launch providers of the last two decades, is going up for sale, a move that could shake up the entire space race. Reporting from Ars Technica laid out details of the potential sale of the Colorado-based rocket company based on information from their sources on March 1st. The sources say that the sale of the ULA will be cemented by year's end, with the whole deal being managed by firms Morgan Stanley and Bain & Company. Having a couple of large investments and consulting firms managing the transaction would certainly lend to the credibility of this reporting and the extremely neutral statements from the ULA's owning partner companies, Boeing and Lockheed Martin, don't deny the sale, saying, quote, Consistent with our corporate practice, Boeing doesn't comment on potential market rumors or speculation about financial activities. So, yeah, that sounds like something is afoot for sure, especially since Lockheed Martin's statement is word for word the same, except for the company name, of course. We're not likely to get confirmation of this before the companies involved make a statement, but there's a big reason why the ULA would be looking to get bought out this year, and its name is SpaceX. First off, the ULA was formed back in 2005 with the backing of the US government. Boeing and Lockheed Martin merged their respective rocket businesses and used those government grants to make a reliable launch company. While the US government secured access to rockets run by two very experienced aerospace companies, it was a win-win, really. And once the shuttle program was finally phased out in 2011, the ULA was basically the only way for the US and more specifically, the Defense Department, to get their important contracts fulfilled, at least until 2017, when SpaceX launched its first defense satellite for them. At launch, SpaceX has gone from startup to king. Over the last four years, Elon Musk's rocket company has safely landed more rocket boosters than the ULA has launched across its whole operational lifetime. In 2022 alone, there were more Falcon 9s launched in a single month than the ULA could hope to match in a whole year. And it's not because their rockets are bad. The Delta IV and the Atlas V are very reliable rockets, while the Centaur and the not-yet-launched Vulcan are very impressive bits of hardware that could compete in this new space race. It's just that the ULA was made in a time before SpaceX proved that safe, quick launch turnaround was a possibility. And even though the Vulcan would help the company gain some ground on their competitors, it seems like it's just too late to stop the company from needing a new buyer. So, who could buy the ULA? Well, lots of companies would want to, for sure. Like we said, the Vulcan and Centaur are paid for, and the company has contracts for their current and future hardware already lined up. There is the possibility that one of the two founding companies might be bought out by the other. Lockheed Martin especially has been working hard in the space industry with a plan to have a lunar lander ready for 2024. Barring that, Amazon or Jeff Bezos' rocket company Blue Origin could make that purchase. The ULA has some contracts with Amazon for that company's network constellation called Project Kuiper, but considering Blue Origin is hid deep in the development of their new Glenn rocket, it would be a little odd for them to purchase a company with an almost finished rocket in that same category if they weren't intending on scrapping the Glenn. It certainly won't be SpaceX. They've got their own new platform on the way and have, at this point, thoroughly left the ULA in the dust. But from the sounds of things, we don't have to worry about them being sold off and dismantled. There's just too much value left in the company. Some other rocket company is about to get one hell of a boost. Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck has apparently floated the idea that the company will rely on ocean recovery methods for their Electron rocket, as opposed to the dynamic helicopter catches they have been attempting. The California-based small launch services company had their annual earnings call on February 28th, and that's when Beck spoke about moving on from the daring mid-air recoveries. His main point was that almost all of the recovered Electron boosters hadn't seemed to suffer much for their exposure to the water, 
referring to the rocket's most recent splashdowns, he said, Electron survived an ocean recovery in remarkably good condition, and in a lot of cases, its components actually pass requalification for flight. Originally, the Electron rocket was designed without recoverability in mind, but the company began making attempts to catch the first stage booster with a helicopter back in 2019. The procedure was about as complex as it sounds, with the intercepting helicopter attempting to hook the parachute lines of a descending booster. To their credit, in May 2022, they actually managed to hook a booster, but quickly released it as conditions became unsafe. Given the complexity of the catch maneuvers, Beck told investors that it works out to be cheaper if they simply recover the booster from the ocean. And that may seem like a no-brainer, but until they had the data back on how well the Electron booster fared after being exposed to seawater, Rocket Lab had no assumptions about the reusability of the vehicle. But now, it seems they are going to take the money used for the helicopter and invest in some waterproofing for Electron instead. He adds that, Financially, it's kind of the same, but we get to actually reuse more vehicles. Electron has been a popular small lift platform for much of its existence. Rocket Lab has a strong record of success with putting small sats and constellations into orbit. Part of that is definitely because Electron is made on very thin margins. It doesn't have heat shields, doesn't carry enough fuel for an automated landing like Falcon 9, and it wasn't intended to be reusable. Rocket Lab is partway through developing their medium lift rocket Neutron, which is planned to be reusable, making automated landings on a barge like SpaceX does with their Falcon 9. Once it's completed, Neutron isn't likely to push Electron into retirement, but any recoverability Rocket Lab can get out of their cheaper vehicle, the better. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.